Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are, as always, glad you're listening today and Looking forward to talking to you. This is a call-in show, so we invite you to call in. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or you can reach me by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, the thing I like about email is that I can see a picture of what you're asking about. Uh, had some several different emails that have come in that we'll be talking about today. Uh, but uh, the photos make it so easy. Sometimes somebody describes something and what I picture in my mind and what you're seeing with your eyes as you describe it may be two different things. Amazingly enough, it often is two different things. So we can sure be more accurate when we take a good look at a picture for a diagnosis or an identification. Uh, there's an email came in uh, recently about, had a couple of bug pictures in it. One of them is a leaf-footed bug. A leaf-footed bug is a long, uh, kind of brown, tan, black, gray looking bug, got a little white band across its back, most of them do, but the back legs are splayed out. They sort of look like a miniature leaf, which is kind of unusual, hence it gets its name. The problem with the leaf-footed bug is it, it attacks our tomato plants. It's a, I guess you could say it's a type of stink bug. It's closely related to a stink bug. Um, the leaf-footed bug and the stink bug both have an odor when you crush them that's pretty darn foul. Uh, but the foulest thing that they do is they put their mouth part into your tomatoes. And I realize we're talking about the lunch hour here, so my apologies, but they spit in your tomato. And their caustic spit dissolves the cells around that area where they stuck their mouth in. Think of it like a hypodermic needle that's spitting out some caustic material. It dissolves the cells and then they slurp the whole thing up move over a little bit, stick their mouth in again, and do the same. That's why you get those little yellow spots all over your tomato. So that's not a very pleasant thought. Um, if you have guests, you might sometime when you're serving tomatoes want to tell them that story. So you can point out the any yellow spots that might be there and just explain to them what they are. And they'll be forever grateful for your uh, nice information that you provided them. You know, that's the danger of listening to a gardening show is as you listen and learn things, you sort of become a horticultural Cliff Clavin. Anybody remember Cheers? Uh, horticultural Cliff Clavin of the neighborhood. And so uh, sometimes that's appreciated, sometimes not. But anyway, speaking of not appreciated, the leaf-footed bug is not appreciated <laughs> because of what they do to our tomatoes. One of the two big tomato pests that really... Uh, I think most annoys me. There are plenty of other things, you know, aphids and spider mites and different kinds of caterpillars like the tomato fruit worm, for example. But the stink bugs and leaf-footed bugs, those are the ones that I most am annoyed by. Well, our phone number, 8, uh, 845-5689 or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Gardensuccess at tamu Dot edu. Well, we're sitting here on the doorstep of spring. Uh, technically, our last average freeze date is toward the end of February, 26, 28, somewhere in there. Kind of depends on how far back you go to get your average. You know, go back 10 years or 20 years, for example. Uh, you get a little bit different number. It seems to be moving earlier over the decades a little bit, a few days over the last maybe three decades. But uh, this is the time when we go out and start believing there's not going to be any more frost, even though average means half the time there will be another frost after that date, 50-50 on that date. So at, at this point in time, though, the likelihood starts to drop day by day by day. And it becomes, you know, very unlikely at some point. Certainly when we get into the first end of the first week of March, it's getting very unusual to have one later, but certainly can. 
Uh, but anyway, I'm planting my tomatoes next week. Uh, this is, I think, you know, a, a time to go ahead and get them out. And there's a couple of reasons I'll mention. But uh, one of the things about planting a little early, even earlier than now, is you can always cover them up. Usually, when we have a late a late freeze or frost, it's it's just that. It's it's very brief. And it's it's very, let's say, mild. Uh, you know, I wouldn't expect to have a a 20 degree day coming up, uh, but I could see maybe having a 28 degree morning that we wake up to. Uh, and so on a 28 type thing, you can cover a tomato plant up and get it through the night and you'll be okay. They won't like it, but if you protect it, it's not going to be killed. And so I go ahead and get mine out. Another reason I plant early is this. Here in uh, Texas, especially in our area, we have a very short window that we can raise tomatoes. Uh, it starts with the last average frost date somewhere in there, uh, but then when it really gets hot, if it's a slicing type tomato, it's just not going to set fruit when uh, it's not just the daytimes being up in the 90s, uh, but it's the, the night times being, you know, in the mid 70s, for example. Uh, and the tomatoes, as it gets in the upper 70s especially, they just don't set fruit well. The large fruited types, the cherries do a little bit better. So if you wait too long, your window of when you can set fruit and harvest fruit gets to be kind of small. So you've gone to the trouble of buying a plant, planting a plant, taking care of a plant, and you get some tomatoes, but then about the time you start getting them, they are not setting, and so you have this little brief time where you're enjoying tomato harvest. By going a little early, and this is important, by choosing varieties that have a fast, day to harvest interval. So if, if you have a, let's say a fast maturing variety, uh, then it can start fruiting and have more time as well before it's not able to fruit well when it's because it's too hot. So uh, I look for tomatoes when I can find them that are going to be, you know, somewhere 68, 72 days to harvest. Uh, somewhere in that range would be nice. Uh, I have some 78 day tomatoes that I plant but not too many and then when it gets up around 80 days then we're talking about things like brandy wine it's a great tomato good tasting but it just it's just uh, not productive because of that window I'm talking about so that's a, another reason to go ahead and get your tomatoes in a little bit early I had a question uh, that came in from Alan, too, about twig girdlers. and sent me a little picture of them. If you've never seen a twig girdler before, uh, it's a little, you know, black, elongated, brown, black, elongated insect with long antenna. And it sits on a twig, typically about the size of a pencil or a little bit larger. And it chews all the way around in a circle. It looks like someone took a little saw and sawed halfway into the twig all the way around it. And so that leaves a very narrow connection to the rest of the branch. And then it lays an egg in that uh, outer portion, outside where it's sawed. And that branch, before long, breaks off there and falls to the ground. And the insect uh, goes through its pupil stage and, and uh, uh, comes back out again. Uh, I believe it's a pupil stage. It may be, I need to look at that. But anyway, it goes, it goes through its life cycle from egg to adult. Uh, and it just comes back and does it again. Now, normally twig girdlers, you know, if you see a bunch of branches on the ground, it's a little alarming. Uh, typically, we see them with pecans. I've seen them with even roses and persimmons. There's a lot of different uh, plants that they will attack. Normally, it just amounts to a little pruning. You know, it's like you went off there and snipped off branches that are the size of a pencil, uh, little twigs the size of a pencil, uh, and that's not going to kill the tree or do any significant damage. In some cases, they can be a little worse, but there's no need to spray. Blasting a spray all the way up through a big tree is just not practical, and it, and it's, it costs money. Uh, most people don't have equipment to do it on a, if the tree's like a pecan and gets pretty large. But all you need to do is when you see those fall to the ground, just pick them up right away. Pick them up, put them in the trash, or if you're out in the country, you can burn the twigs if you want or bury them down in the ground, but since it's branch, little small branches, it's a little hard to bury unless you break them up a lot. I just usually cut mine up, put them in the trash, and be done with it, uh, and get them out of there, because if you leave them, then they come out of the twig that fell, and, and here you go again. Uh, but that's a, that's a picture that we've had come in. It's one that uh, is common. Uh, it's just one you need to 
You just need to do do that sanitary measure I mentioned, and and they'll do pretty good. All right, our phone number is eight four five five six eight nine. If you'd like to give us a call, or Garden Success at t a m u dot e d u. Garden Success at t a m u dot e d u. Now that we're getting a little bit of warm up coming on, uh, it's it's definitely spring, and spring fever is. It's hitting right now. Boy, we had some good weekend weather last weekend. And whenever you had good weather, everybody heads to the garden centers, which, of course, the garden centers are happy to see. Uh, and that's a, you know, you got to, you, you see folks that are at a garden center, running a garden center, and it's all busy and everything. And you think, man, that's that's just a great way to make money. Well, it is until you have about three rainy spells in the spring. And uh, when most of the business occurs of the year, and that's a little bit of a challenge. So like any kind of agricultural or horticultural business, uh, it is subject to the vicissitudes of nature. How's that for a for a phrase? Uh, and uh, I had a strawberry patch one time. And, you know, we have about a mm, three or four week significant harvest window in the spring. Well, spring is also a time when it typically rains. And so I've had years where maybe two or three of the of the weekends we were supposed to make money it was raining and people don't come out to pick strawberries and it just gives you an appreciation for the things that farmers and ag businesses in general they have to deal with uh, and so I'm, I'm always happy to see Chamber of Commerce weather on a weekend in the spring, not only because I want to get out and purchase some things, but I just know that it helps those local businesses uh, that are here in our community that provide us with all those things we want to go get and plant. Well, let's uh, go now to the phones. Again, the number 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Ed. Hello, Ed. Uh, hi, Skip. Uh, you probably had to answer this question a dozen times, uh, but I've missed it. And um, we, our yard is terribly infested with winter ryegrass on okay. top of our uh, St. Augustine. Okay. And and it's happening all around our neighborhood. Yeah. Is there any? Is there a herbicide that is selective enough to take out the um, rye and leave the St. Augustine alone? Th- there's not. Um, so what you do is you mow, and if you see any seed heads forming, which they will, you need to gather those clippings in a bag. Normally we return clippings, but gather those up and don't let them go back in the yard and avoid that reseeding, or at least, let's say, minimize the reseeding, and that would be really helpful. Next September, about the second week of September, maybe third, uh, you can use a pre-emergent herbicide, and that would prevent cool season weeds from coming up. So things like clover and henbit and chickweed and carpet weed and ryegrass. Uh, if it's a, if it's a herbicide that's a pre-emergent that works on grass, some work better on broadleaf, some work better on grass. Uh, you can prevent it for next year. But in the meantime, I would prevent those plants from sentencing you to several more years of seeded uh, mess. Great. And uh, if I now, is this time to apply a pre-emergent for broad leaves that might be coming up for the summer? Well, you could, but it's actually a little later than we'd like to start. We would like okay. to say mid-February get those down because when the temperature of the soil warms up a bit, and by late February it's there most years, uh, then here come the, the warm season weeds like crabgrass. Uh, and as it warms up a little bit more, we have other weeds, uh, goosegrass, and we have, uh, uh, let's see, what's another common? Oh, grass burr uh, that, that germinate a little bit later. Uh, so you could probably do some good, depending on the weeds that you have a problem with in your yard, by, by applying something now. But in general, just kind of put it on your calendar mid-February to get that done. Okay, mid-February or September 1 for the... Um... Uh, cool m- Mid-September. Mid-September. Yeah, I okay. usually say the third week, but somewhere okay. in there. You know, every year's different. That's the problem. Oh, yeah. uh, and this year seems to be coming a little early, judging by when things are blooming. So that's why I wouldn't delay one day more if you're going to put a pre-emergent down, right. just knowing that it may be a little late on some things. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you for the call. Uh-huh. Bye. Uh, bye-bye. All right. Our phone number, 845 845- Five six eight nine, and now we're going to go to the phones and talk to Mark. Hey, Mark. 
Howdy, Skip. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. What's up? Hey, thanks for thanks for your great work. Uh, so we planted some live oaks at, at the Money Pit, and uh, the deer uh, must have used them to rub their antlers on uh, whatever yes. that's called, right. rub it in your whatever, mm-hmm. right? And it went to the you know most of the bark circumferentially is gone, mm-hmm. uh, and they're new trees. Mm-hmm. Um, they're like eight feet and you know a, an inch, two inches in diameter or whatever mm-hmm. but um the question that we are facing is that we've now of course have uh barriers around the other trees right mm-hmm. um which i go why didn't we do that earlier but we didn't anyway uh should we just remove those trees and count it a loss replace them with new ones instead of trying to nurture them through the the leaf foliage is excellent. Yeah. Time. You know, Mark, that's a, that's, it's, it, it's a gray area. If, right. if the tree if has been stripped, let's say two thirds of the way around, then mm-hmm. I would just replace it. I mean, it, okay. the time it's going to take for that right. living strip to callus and come all the way over again is a little yeah. bit long. Uh, but yeah. the good thing, the thing in your favor is it's a young, vigorous tree, and so it'll happen right. faster than on an older tree that's not not as vigorous. Uh, oh. So, okay. but if it's, you know, if you're halfway, let's say 50-50, I don't know. The, the trees cost money, and so it might be worth, you know, giving it a try. But there's nothing yeah. wrong with just cutting your losses and putting another one in. Uh, yeah. So I, I would say it depends on how much bark you've lost in terms of... Yeah going around the circumference of the trunk. Right, right. He must have liked it, the ones he worked on because <laughs> he took them to town. And so well, as much as I hate to take them out, I yeah. I think I will. And uh, we might plant them elsewhere and just see if they make it. But, well, uh, now we just need to teach mockingbirds to learn from that deer. My mockingbirds will take one peck out of each tomato <laughs> and ruin the whole crop rather than, hey, I'll give you a tomato if you just eat on one tomato and eat the whole hey, thing. Hey, buddy, I... I, I'm so proud you have the courage to try to, you know, anything. We, I grew up here in the 60s, and Papa, a chemistry professor, tried it all. And uh, we ended up celebrating the animals that ran off with everything because we got nothing. Maybe a few cucumbers, but that was it. And uh, wow. I'm so proud. What, one final question. So we're going to put in some Belinda's Dreams because last year, one we did, it didn't get watered enough, whatever, my fault. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a fence, and I was, you know, initially thinking we'll just go with boxwood because it'll make it look nice and professional from the street, Mm -hmm. and uh, and Lord knows that needs to happen. Uh, And then I thought, well, we could put in Belinda's dream, and the question I have for you, sir, is would would you even consider putting a boxwood hedge with Belinda's dream in front of it, or does that seem redundant? I think or? the Belinda's dream is going to get bigger faster than than a lot of your boxwoods. So okay. I think they're going to end up hiding them. A boxwood's a beautiful hedge. It it oh, just great. over the years it, it, there are several issues that can happen with boxwoods. Mm. Uh, there mm. are some root diseases, uh, root, mm. um, and uh, there are some. Um, there's a thing called boxwood blight that's been a problem that's growing mm. uh, uh, around the country. Uh, mm. So I'm not as excited about them as I used to be. I'm not at a point where I tell people don't plant a boxwood uh, because they're still okay. a beautiful shrub. But uh, the right. Belinda's dream in and of itself is going to be pretty. It's just not going to be evergreen like the boxwood would be. Uh, so so in, the, in the winter, though, you, there wouldn't be a barrier from the street. Right. The Belinda's dream. Right. So that's the downside. Well, the the Belinda's dream would be a a, tr- a foot traffic barrier. They're not going to come crawling through that. But oh, as yeah, far as no, a visual like barrier, no yeah, you'd want something a little taller. Uh, so I w- you could consider an evergreen shrub there. It would just need to come up a little higher. The Belinda's dream, that, if with some pruning, higher than Belinda's dream. I mean, could the could the boxwood do that, or is that? Well, in time, some Not of the a short stretch. Yeah, and some yeah. of the time, some of the box would get larger. But Belinda's dream, with moderate amount of pruning, uh, is going to be right. about a four foot plant. You know, and it, it oh. can get a little higher than that. Oh. But but generally, we oh. keep ours at you know at about four feet, and so your hedge then would need to be something that's probably up in the six foot range if you're wanting yeah. to block a view. So I don't know what your goals are. 
and that wouldn't and the box boxwood six foot is not going to happen. That that's a lot to ask. Uh, that's a lot to ask in any in any amount of time. You know, we, okay. we could say right. eventually, sure. but yeah, in any amount of time, okay. I think that's that's a lot to ask. And when we plant Belinda's dream, uh, would you favor putting compost, just a, a handful, around it, or just put the normal dirt and, and hardwood mulch? I, I would mix compost into the soil in a large area that's going to be your Belinda's dream bed. And oh. then I would dig a hole, plant the Belinda's dream, and use the soil you dug out of the hole. I wouldn't put compost in the hole. I, I would just amend the soil in a large area if you want to do that. That's good. But above, above, above where you plant it, not in the soil that you put back in the hole. Right, right. Amend okay. the hole. I'm gonna say amend the whole area, and then dig the hole right. and use the dug soil to put back in the hole. Oh, so you put the 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 compost on the ground, then the mulch, blend mm-hmm. it up. Right. Dig up wherever you're gonna plant the Belinda's dream, blend all of that soil with what you've got above, put that back in, and then repeat the compost and mulch on top. Right. I'm, I'm going to tweak what you said just a little bit. You put the compost okay. down, you mix it into the soil. So now the okay. entire area, let's, I don't know, depends on how much, how deep you dig, but let's say it's yeah. now 25% compost mixed into soil by volume. Okay. And then you dig a hole and put that soil back in with the rows. Don't put just compost in the hole. And then sure. the mulch, when you're all done, then the mulch goes on top of everything. But not, not extra compost. Right. Mulch, mulch okay. is a blanket on the surface. Compost is amendment in the soil. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay? Cool. So, so that's, that's great to know. And how deep would you go with the compost? Two inches, three inches? If you've never amended the soil before there, I would do about three inches and mix it as three. deep as you can. You could also oh. buy a bed mix from a soil yard, an already mixed bed mix, lay it on top of the ground and use it to make a raised bed area that you plant in. So that's another oh, option. Okay, well, it all sounds great. Just all right. love your show. And thank you, Skip. Take care. All right, thank you for the question. Enjoy spring. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, it's 845-5689 if you'd like to give us a call. And now we're going to go talk to Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, Skip. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, thanks. I was well, too, until yesterday I had a look at my iris uh, bed mm-hmm. and saw that it's getting yellow. Hmm. And so I dug out the information you gave me last May regarding iris rust. Okay. And I thought, oh my goodness, is that what this is again? But now this is happening before the bloom. Okay. And and you know, last time we were dealing with it after the flowers bloomed, and then you had said uh, if it occurs, remove uh, uh, infected foliage, and then use uh, one of these uh, fungicides that I can't pronounce. Okay. So now I want to know, it's early spring. I would really like them to flower. Do you think they are going to flower because they're getting yellow? Do you think I should put the fungicide or something else on it Yeah, it's at hard. this point? It is hard for me to answer that because I really need to see it. Uh, if you could take some close-up pictures and good sharp focus and email them to me. I'll be glad to take a look. Different things can cause leaves to turn yellow on an iris. If it's an older leaf, you know, it could be due to a number of different factors, often related to soil moisture or something else like that, and it's not a disease issue at all. Uh, Iris rust can also cause yellowing, but usually with rust, you see some little rusty, I'll call them pustules on the leaf where it's like the spores are breaking through the leaf and it gets its name because they're kind of a rusty color Uh, Uh and the the infection of that leaf can also cause yellowing but I don't want to assume that we're not going to send you out to put a fungicide on without even a good diagnosis so let's look at some pictures and then uh, take some up close and maybe one of the whole area just kind of so I can see everything around them but uh, some up close and make sure, check them before you send them, make sure they're in good sharp focus. 
Okay, I'll do that right now. All right. Thanks very much for your advice. I Th appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, our phone number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, uh, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. All right, let's see. We had a question uh, that came in from Marion, and Marion uh, sent some pictures in, uh, wanting to know about a plant identification. And that is not a soap berry, uh, Marion, that I'm looking at the pictures. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell which plant it is because the foliage is brand new, just starting to come out from the buds. Uh, but I, I do know one thing. That's not a western soap berry that, that you were asking us about. So... Uh, uh, let's see. Let it get a little older. Let's take a no look at another picture, and maybe we can uh, maybe we can identify something uh, for that. Uh, Kenton, we got an email from you, but I didn't see any uh, content in there. So could you please try to resend? Uh, this is the uh, the season when a lot of things are going on uh, around town. A lot of activities, uh, gardening clubs, and things like that meeting. Uh, so one thing I would like to talk about for sure is this Saturday to uh, see day after tomorrow, March 4th uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 and on Sunday, March 5th from 11 to 4, the Brazos County Annual Home and Garden Show. And this will be at the Legends Event Center in Midtown Park. Now, you may have gone to the Home and Garden Show before out at the Expo Center, but this year, Midtown Park in Bryan, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, going to be on those two days, 4th and the 5th, uh, 9 to 5 on the on Saturday, 11 to 4 on Sunday. There's going to be gardening seminars that the Master Gardeners, our Brazos County Extension Master Gardeners, are going to be putting on. Uh, let me just give you some examples. I always say you should listen to the show with a pen in hand and a piece of paper because you might want to write some of this down. Uh, but on Saturday, 10 a.m., there'll be a talk on rain, water harvesting, and rain barrels. Uh, continuing along the rain theme, at 11.15, there'll be a talk on rain gardens. you know what a rain garden is? It's an area that tends to be too wet. And you know how we always say with almost every plant it needs good drainage? Well, rain gardens are for plants that don't need good drainage. And I'll use Louisiana iris as an example. They, grow in a, they can grow in a swamp. Uh, they don't have to be in a swamp, but they, they like that. They put up with that. And so you're going to learn how to create areas in your yard that are suitable for plants when things get a little too wet at times. So I guess that's a version of when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Why not turn those low, poorly drained areas into a beautiful area? 11.15, rain gardens. At 1 p.m., natives in my backyard. This is still Saturday on uh, native plants. That's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, and then 2.15, gardening with your pets in mind. <laughs> oh, boy. Gardening with your I have to tell a a story on one of my dogs here uh, if we got a little time later today but gardening with your pets in mind sunday at 11 a.m heirloom bulbs for brazos gardens do you know that there are a lot of bulbs that are not like hyacinth and tulips you know hyacinth and tulips we call those one-shot wonders you plant them they pop up they bloom and essentially they're gone they may struggle into a second year and not do well at all uh, but they're one-shot wonders but we have heirloom bulbs they just come back year after year after year. You've probably driven around in September and seen oxblood lilies, also called schoolhouse lilies, popping up with their little red trumpets or maybe a red spider lily type thing coming up. Uh, we have some wonderful bulbs for here. You can learn about those two and many more at 11 a.m. on Sunday. And then 12.30 p.m., just after lunch on Sunday, is Gardening with Children. A program on gardening with children. I think if you've got kiddos or grandkiddos, you need to come hear that one because you get a lot of ideas on ways to uh, garden and teach kids in the garden. And I'm biased, I know, I'm a horticulturist, but I just think working with kids is the most important thing we can do in our gardens. Uh, kids learning to grow food, kids learning to eat good, healthy food. Not fast food, uh, but, but to grow things and eat things and appreciate the wonder of the natural world. It's just a win, win, win. So to garden and uh, not teach children is, is missing out. Uh, those are a few things. I'm going to come back to some other activities. But right now we're going to go to the phones and talk to Dan. 
Hello, Dan. Hi, Skip. Um, I was calling to see if I could get your opinion on <clears throat> removing a yard full of grass and turning it into a native prairie. Um, okay. Do you, have, do you have any thoughts about uh, doing such a thing? Is it a good idea, a bad idea? Am I going to get a ticket from the city for not mowing my lawn? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about the city. If you have a homeowner's association, I bet they have strong feelings, but you would have to ask them. Uh, but I think any time we create native natural areas, that's a good thing. Uh, it's not going to be the manicured look, uh, but neither is nature. And so uh, there are some, some wonderful plants, uh, certainly, uh, I'll say, meadow-type grasses. Uh, uh, and there's also other natural, native, uh, meadow-type other plants that, that could be included in a yard like that. Uh, there's good information out there on how to do that. I think that, um, uh, you know, we generally don't recommend like companies and products and businesses and stuff, but uh, just to get you off to a good start, there's a place called Native American Seed, and it's in Junction, Texas, and they specialize in seeds for that kind of thing. You know, they'll have a mix that does well in our area or a mix that does well in the high plains and so on. And they have a lot of educational material online. And I would encourage you to go take that a look, take a look at that. There are other places that sell those kinds of seeds. Uh, but that's just a real quick, easy visit that I think would, would help get you off to a good start. Could you say the name one more time? Yes, Native American Seed, Junction, okay. Texas. And that's that's my good fast answer. And again, I'm not promoting that as you know that business i'm just they just happen to have some good educational material online so i'll point you in that direction um do you know or have you seen in our area where anyone has done it or is there a part of campus that one could go look at to see what the result would be that's a good question um think about campus they were working with some area like that out at the gardens and i'm not sure where that project is right now uh, the, our Native Plant Society here and our Brazos Valley chapter of the Master Naturalist could probably point you at some specific areas that they have worked with, um, you know, where you could go and see that kind of thing. Uh, off the top of my head right now, it's just not coming to mind where to point you specifically for that. Um, just gosh, I, I should be able to tell you a place, but right now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. But I know there are a few. The Brazos Valley Master Naturalists, you can do a little Google search for them uh, and find them and get in contact with them. They meet at our office uh, monthly, and uh, those folks would be a wealth of information uh, to direct you on that. Great. Thank you very much. These are excellent resources. All right. Good. Thank you very much for the call. Bye-bye. We're going to go to the phones. The number 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Boy, it's easy to tell spring has sprung uh, here. With the, uh, We had a call drop off. Uh, did Should I invite them to call back, or did they just need to go? Okay. Uh, we're going to go now and talk to Suzanne. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Skip. How are you this afternoon? Well, I'm doing well on a day like this. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I have a few questions here. I hope I won't take up too much time so the other callers can call and get their answers question. But okay. I have I have several things bought. I have the lightweight netting that you talked about. Okay. I also have the frost cloth. I have some of the little hoops and things like to cover plants. Say if we get, I'm from the old school and I always like I cover my tomatoes, which I already have in my raised beds mm -hmm. there some of them are about almost a foot tall okay so on these cooler nights i've been covering with just some garden uh pots you know like you get trees and things in just those plastic type buckets well if you do get a frost or a freeze and i cover them with that is there a need to put on the frost cloth in addition to the buckets or the buckets enough or don't put the buckets on and just Use the frost cloth, or okay, or T what would you suggest on something like that? Yeah, tell me again the plant that we're talking about. Okay, I have uh, some tomatoes planted. Okay, and uh, I've been just covering on some of these cooler nights. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not for sure. I've heard different things like tomatoes don't like it below fifty. So yeah, 
when it gets in the mid 40s i've been going out and just covering up sometimes with a double uh just a black bucket like you would get say like a shrub or something with in. okay uh-huh. and i've just been covering those but like if i have all these other things box i want to try it out so if if we do get a frost could i if i want to try the like the little frost cover that you put on your plant okay would you do in addition to the buckets or no. leave the buckets off no, the, well, if the tomato fit under a bucket, that's just fine. Just put a weight on it so that it sort of seals the bucket against the ground because you're going to want the warmth of the soil rising up underneath that bucket. Okay. Okay. And that, I do that. Mm-hmm. I uh-huh. put a brick on top. All right. And you can do that. Uh, you can you could instead just put a cover over the plants. Uh, but a lot of the spun bound polyester covers, they are porous and, and the air can move through. And while they protect against a frost from forming on the plant surfaces, the frost forms instead on the cover, uh, but uh, they don't hold the heat in as much as like a impermeable cover, like a plastic type cover. You would just need something to support that cover, whether it's plastic or whatever, above the plant so that where like plastic touches the plant leaf, it you're going to get burned there on a on a freezing night. One thing I do with my tomatoes is I get a milk jug or anything like that and fill it with water. In fact, I use two jugs, one on each side of the plant, right up against it. And water cools off slower than air does. And so over the course of the night, it keeps that area around the stem of the plant and the foliage a little bit warmer if you have a cover that's stopping the wind from blowing through. Okay. Okay. And, and so the, I just do that. And typically our, the kinds of frost and freezes we have now are going to almost always be very brief. So it may dip down below freezing for an hour, two, something like that in the morning. And so all we need is to slow that cool off a little bit and we, we're just fine. Okay. So you, on the milk jugs, I do have some <laughs> sitting out there. So you yeah. would put those right next to the plant. And you said you also have a cover, like some sort of plastic or right. I, I like I like plastic because it absolutely creates dead air space. But you got to seal, you know, got to pin it to the ground everywhere so the wind doesn't blow up underneath it. Your bucket does the same thing, and that's fine. You just can't. I don't think you get two milk jugs inside a bucket. No, uh, or maybe okay. one, maybe, and one would help. But uh-huh. but what we're trying to do is we're stopping cold air from blowing through and, and displacing our warmer air around the plant. And secondly, we're providing something that is slowing that cooling a little bit. And that makes a difference. And I've taken, I've planted tomatoes in mid-February and, you know, done that on a few nights and they just, they did just fine. Okay. And then I have some green beans that are about uh, two inches tall. Okay. Uh, well, this I, I looked looked at the weather, and so if it gets down to like forty seven or something, will that hurt the green beans? Do I need to cover those? Well, I generally don't cover at that temperature. I mean, it when you have cold weather like that on these plants, it'll set them back, and they don't you know they don't like it at all. Uh, uh-huh. But so I guess you can make a case for covering, not because the plant's going to freeze at forty seven but because it just kind of keeps it going a little faster. You know, it doesn't come to a halt and then have to take off running again. Uh, so I, that would be the benefit on a non-freezing night for providing a little protection. Just remember to take it off the next day so the sun can shine down and, and get that thing going. What about, I bought some of the lightweight netting that you spoke about uh, in your previous shows is that does that help hold a little heat in too, or is that basically for insects, wind, or or what would that be used for? Just your okay. lightweight. So, so when you say lightweight netting, you mean like a, a it, it's like a little window screen squares, but right. real soft. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, that uh-huh. won't hold hold any air or warmth at all. That, okay, the, the spun bound polyester is more of a solid material. Uh, uh-huh. For those who are out there that are seamstresses, it's like stabilizer, but much softer. But it has that same kind of, you know, spun material. So air moves through it, but moves slowly through it. Is that basically just to uh, uh, keep the insects from going in? Or? Yes. Uh huh. And it it well it holds it 
it, it protects against frosts. You know, if it's going to go down to 27, it's probably not going to be enough. But if it's just, you know, maybe 30 degrees or so, it, it'll be just fine. Okay. 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 All right. Well, thank you for taking my call. All right, Suzanne. Thank you for the call. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689. Had a question from Gabriel. She has a Dracaena, looks like, house plant, and the top growth looks great, but as you get toward the bottom of the plant, the edges and tips of the leaves are, are brown, uh, ter- yellow and then brown out near the tip. That is most likely due to a period where it dried out. That is in a terracotta container terracotta wicks moisture so uh, nothing wrong with terracotta pots they just need to be watered a little bit more a plastic sided container uh, would not allow the escape of moisture from the sides as much as terracotta would Uh, i still like terracotta i'm just pointing out that this plant is going to dry out a little faster than normal also it's a really big plant in a pretty small container And so that's another reason that you're going to need to water that thing more often. And it probably went, um, you know, if it's in my house, it's going to, I'm going to forget to water them all the time, but uh, I just get busy and don't get around to it. Uh, So this one probably went through a period of a little drought. And I think that's the primary thing that you're seeing on there. It's also possible that if you used a salt-based fertilizer, a synthetic fertilizer, and overdid it, that you can get some tip and margin burn on leaves from that. Looking at the plant overall, I don't think that's the problem. I think it's a soil moisture problem. And I hope that uh, helps, uh, Gabrielle. Uh, Our phone number, 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu.com. Edu Garden Success at tamu. Edu. Uh, going to the emails, uh, Tad sent a picture of some palm trees that survived that horrific freeze and summer drought, and kind of curious what they are. It's a little hard to tell from the distance in the picture, Tad. But uh, first of all, drought and palms is not a big deal. Uh, they're they're pretty tolerant of that. Uh, that means not doesn't mean they don't want water. They do want water, but uh, they're fairly tolerant of that. Uh, the cold is different. I'm going to guess that those are probably Mexican fan palms, looking at them from a distance. That is a pretty hardy palm. There are some other palms that are fairly hardy. And when we had our February 21 freeze, we learned a lot about palm hardiness. And uh, out at the... Out at the uh, gardens on campus, which if you've never been there, you've got to get out there. It's a wonderful place. Uh, take time out in the weekends to visit. By the way, on the weekends, you can park there in the AgriLife lot. That's a big glass building on West Campus by the gardens. Uh, the first lot there is 97. As long as it's not a numbered space on the weekends, that's free parking. Or you can go across the street uh, to, to the, um, uh, col- the uh, arena um, and park in that lot kind of over toward the garden's end, and that's free on weekends, too. Uh, but that there are some palms on, on site at the gardens on campus, and I believe those are Mexican fan palms. If someone knows otherwise, please call and let me know. Uh, but they, they survived that that kind of cold weather and did did really well. That's my best guess, uh, Tad, based on, on the, the photo. Uh, let's see, did we have a call in? Uh, okay, who is our caller? All right, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, how are you doing today? Good. Uh, how can we help? I I have a question about POA, the annual, what is it, annual rye? No, it's not annual ryegrass. Annual, blue, poa, annual, annual bluegrass. Yeah, annual bluegrass. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, so there is not a pre-emergent on the market for that anymore, right? There are. Uh, oh. There are a number of pre-emergent grass products that, have in the past controlled it pretty well, but now we're seeing more resistant types of POA annua or the the annual bluegrass, and so sometimes products that used to work don't work anymore. Yeah, that's because uh, I I have a service that comes out and does all that. Yes, for mm-hmm. me, and and it's still that I've got the POA all over the backyard. So, okay, should I just like do Roundup now or? Well, if you've POA is probably already seeding in your in your yeah. lawn. 
And so, you know, even if you kill the, the plants uh, with, a, with a herbicide, there's probably viable seed there that are going to still mm-hmm. come back. Now, the idea of hand pulling, I, I do that with a lot of weeds, but poa is a, <laughs> a little bit of a challenge to hand pull. So much. And so I hate to send you out to do that because it doesn't just come right up. It's a grass. It's got a nice right. wide fibrous root system and you pull up half the dirt trying to do it. Uh, so th- I think the best thing you can do is set your mower as low as you can, gather mm-hmm. as much of the seed as you can in a bagger to minimize that problem. So. Okay. So mow it really close and then bag up those yeah, clippings. Yeah, mow and bag. And that's not going to get all the seeds out, but at least okay. it's better than not doing anything. Uh, yeah. and, and then next year, uh, maybe having them shift. I don't know which which product they use. There's a number of different pre-emergents that are really good against grass. Uh, okay. And uh, so it, it would have taken, I would just switch to a different one if if they feel like it's a resistance issue at your yard. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, mm-hmm. so this, this is your, your friend, Jennifer, um, oh. you know, from college station. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, uh, I, I, regarding the, uh, plant sale, the rooted in plant sale, oh, um, yes. mm-hmm. still nailing down a location, but I was able to get them to add college station. So if somebody has, if they want to order one of those, they can just click, you know, select College Station for the location, and then we'll email you with the pickup location when and, it gets closer to the time. And that's that. Roughly, when would people be able to see the plants coming in? I mean, you know, within um, a week or they, two. They um, no, the it's the pickup time is going to be Saturday, April first, April first, uh, eight a.m. to eleven a.m. I think. Okay, April first. No yeah. fooling, huh? Okay. No fooling. April first. Yeah, okay. I know there's a hundred thousand things going on that weekend, but they can just select College Station as their pickup location, and then. Um, pick it up. Yep. Make okay. Sure. Hey, well, let me turn okay. the call around right quick. I, I had a okay. question, I think it was sure. last week, uh, and I, we needed to ask you. Uh, someone asked about, you know, the in, I'll say the old days, we had chlorinated water, um, mm-hmm. and then there's things called chloramines, I think, that are mm-hmm. used more now. Can you comment on what typically is used now in water supplies for that purpose? And secondly, with the old chlorine, you put out your water, let it sit overnight, and then put the goldfish in the bowl. What about mm-hmm. with chloramines? I think they're a little more persistent, right? Right, yeah. So the chloramine has a different, uh, it has like a lower residual. College Station still uses uh free chlorine for their drinking water free chlorine so, okay yeah so you know the regular it's just gas chlorine um mm-hmm. so no changes there but if someone is in college station and they're served by wellburn water mm-hmm. i believe they use chloramine for all or part of their system and it's the ammonia that part of the chloramines that i think is the problem with the fish because if, you know with their waste they're going to contribute to ammonia in the fish tank so i think that's the issue there and i think that there are some chemicals that you can add to the tank to okay. um, counteract that. So probably just need to kind of Google that, <laughs> as they say. Yeah, yeah. Or, okay. or, you know, look up their drinking water quality report. They, everybody's got their reports online mm-hmm. um, or just or just call your system and then find out what the what the chloramine level is and then go to the pet store and check on how to get the right water quality for your fish. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of peppering you with questions on this. But <laughs> okay. to, to your to your knowledge, do you do you think that just as far as watering plants, uh, water with chloramine is not a huge concern? I, yeah, I'm not aware of any issues okay. with that. It's it's more of just with the fish tanks because of their the ammonia from their waste. All right. Well, hey. Yeah. Been a, it's been a good call. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good talking to you. Thanks. <laughs> you too. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left here. Our phone number is eight four five fifty six eighty nine, and we're going to go talk to Ronnie now. Hello, Ronnie. Hey, Skip, I don't know if you've addressed this already, but uh, congratulations on your new radio talk show. Thank you very much. Houston. That, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, they're going to they're gonna really uh, enjoy your knowledge. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, I recently just planted 10 uh, five-gallon live oaks. Okay. And and I, I planted them last weekend, so it's pretty windy. And I didn't feel like the need to stake them. Do you think I can get away with not staking them? A, a tree that's grown properly in, and planted properly so that the, the cylinder that came out of the container is, you know, has soil firmed around it so that cylinder's not wobbling around in the ground. If it was grown properly, 
the where it enters the soil, it's got good stable connection. So if you grab the top and move it, it's not like it's hinged at the bottom. You know, the whole thing moves. It ought to bend like a fishing pole. Like if you imagine set, you know, putting the bottom of a fishing pole in concrete and then grabbing the top and bending it over, that bends a lot at the top, but less as you go down toward the bottom. If a tree is like that, it's you don't have to stake it unless you're just in an area where there's a very unique wind issue going on. Uh, so I think you should be fine. If it's not grown properly and it is, it, the whole thing moves like a straight stick, but more down at the bottom, uh, then I, I think a stake is going to be needed for a while. Okay. Okay. So can, I, can I just play it? Play it by ear for a little bit, or I think you could. Uh, you know, there's different okay. ways of doing this. You can put a stake in and tie them to two stakes the trees in between two different stakes or you can do the little guy wires that go all the way to the ground and there's a little stake in the bottom so it's more like a you know a, a teepee type wire arrangement where it goes up and attaches and then the other side goes down just whenever you stake a tree don't stake it tight let it move a little bit you want it to move because as it moves the branch gets stronger if you stake it just tight still and that tree doesn't move, it's not going to develop the same strength of branches of trunk as fast as it would if it, ha it was able to move just a little bit. Okay. And one more question. Is there any value of root stimulator on these? You know, the, the, the debate is out on that. There are a number of different things that can be in a root stimulator. Sometimes they have vitamins in there. Sometimes they have kinds of hormones in there. And sometimes even nutrients in there. Uh, I, I, it won't hurt, but I... I I've not yet heard, um, uh, you know, certified arborists talking about using those. Uh, I am not an arborist. I'm a horticulturist. And so um, I won't say that that's a definitive answer by any means, but um, I, I've never used them myself. But okay. I don't know. Depending on the product and the situation, there may be some benefits to be had. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. It. You bet. Good thank, luck. thank you, Ronnie. I appreciate that. All right, folks, we've got time for one quick call if you call right away. Uh, in the meantime, let's see. Uh, I'm going to go down here and look at what's going on. Uh, I've had a question. Um, let's see, I'm missing one here, trying to get back to it. Well, looks like it escaped me. Uh, I want to... I want to talk about some other things going on around town then before we run out of show today. Uh, on Friday and Saturday, March 17th and 18th, is the 28th annual Herbal Forum and Plant Sale at the Festival Institute out in Round Top, Texas. Lots of, of course, it's all about herbs out there, uh, but they also have annuals and perennials and, and other native plants uh, that you can check out. But that's out in Round Top, uh, March 17th and 18th. Friday and Saturday. On Saturday the 18th at the John Ferry Garden is their budding out plant sale and festival. So they'll have sales, they'll have vendors out there too, by the way, food options and music and so on. Uh, if you're not a member, it is $5 to get in. If you are a member, you get in free. Uh, and that is, uh, if you want to know more, go to jfgarden.org. Now, on Saturday, March 25th, our Brazos County Master Gardeners are having their annual plant sale at the AgriLife Extension Office out on County Park Court, which is next to the County Tax Office. They're going to have annuals and perennials and vegetables and herbs. Uh, and I think my favorite part is the pass-along plants, where Master Gardeners uh, dig up things that they have in their yard that maybe you just can't buy any, everywhere. Uh, and they bring uh, plants that they've brought along with them to uh, sell to raise funds and their funds go to help support our AgriLife Extension programming, our Master Gardener activities and programming. Uh, good cause, I guess. Uh, I, a biased person myself would say, uh, but I think that's good and they have a lot of great plants. So you got to at least try the pass alongs. I mean, that's that's a long time history. You know, you've heard of plant swaps where people uh, all bring their plants and they trade off and things. Uh, well, this is part of their sale, but it's the same kind of thing. You're getting some of the plants are going to be plants that that the master gardeners have grown themselves. So obviously, uh, those are plants that are going to do really well here. On Thursday, March, oh, wait, let's see, we just, that's today, hold on, tonight, uh, Thursday, March 2nd, I'll make sure I didn't already pass this, uh, at the Larry J. Ringer Library, the gardens at Texas A&M present Getting the Kids Outside. 
So you know spring is springing or sprung and a new season uh, means new things to explore. So you come and learn about some simple act outdoor activities you can do with the kids in your life uh, from a backyard garden to the neighborhood park. Uh, Kat Greer, who is out at the gardens on campus, uh, is going to be your speaker. She's going to share some of her favorite uh, ways to get outside with the kids. But that is at the Larry Ringer Library on Harvey Mitchell Parkway down in College Station. And that is from 6.30 to 7 tonight, and it's free. So I encourage you uh, to take advantage of that. Saturday, March 4th, the Rio Brazos Audubon Society is going to have their birding walk that we talk about often here. Uh, you can show up out there at 8.30. If you got binoculars, bring them. If not, they'll have a few extra around and learn all about birding. And as you walk around, what the songs of different birds sound like so you can learn to identify them. Out on Saturday at the gardens on campus, uh, our master gardener, Mike Vedreen, vegetable specialist uh, for us in our Brazos County program, is going to be talking on vegetable gardening, secrets of growing vegetables. If you ever seen Mike's garden, you would want to go hear him because he probably knows what he's talking about. He's also a good speaker. Uh, that's at 10 a.m. at the gardens on campus. You can park in lot uh, 97, which is by the AgriLife Center, the Glass Building. You can park across the street at Reed Arena parking lot, uh, which is lot 100. Those are free on the weekends, so go and check those out. Uh, While well, you've been listening to Garden Success, I'm your host, Skip Richter. We're here every Thursday, and tell your friends about it. We're available by podcast, too, if you miss some shows. But we look forward to talking to you again. Hope to talk to you next week. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.